Hi, uh, my name is David Shaivitz. I am a professor of Jewish history here at Northwestern and director of the Crown Family Center for Jewish and Israel Studies. It is a real pleasure to welcome all of you here tonight to the latest installment of the Manfred Vogel Memorial Lecture, uh, which honors Professor Manfred Vogel, who was a longtime pillar of Jewish studies education here at Northwestern. Uh, before kicking things off, please allow me to just say a word or two about the Crown Family Center for Jewish and Israel Studies, who's convening tonight's uh, gathering, uh, and to acknowledge a few of the people who've made tonight's event possible. The Crown Family Center for Jewish and Israel Studies is an academic hub for undergraduate and graduate education, faculty and student research, and accessible and engaging public programming. Our students, affiliated faculty members, and visiting professors and postdoctoral fellows study, teach, and research Jewish history, Jewish philosophy and thought, Hebrew and Yiddish language and literature, Holocaust studies, and the history, politics, and culture of the state of Israel. The Crown Family Center is comprised of over a dozen aff affiliated full-time faculty members, a robust group of visiting scholars and postdoctoral fellows, an undergraduate major, two minors, uh, an interdisciplinary graduate cluster, and dozens of annual courses that enroll hundreds of students each year. Uh, to learn more about the center, please grab a newsletter. Um, note, there are no newsletters outside, but please go to our website, www.jewish-studies.northwestern.edu, where you can find a newsletter, where you can find much more information about upcoming programming. Uh, we'd love to be able to welcome you to future events um, in the coming academic year. Uh, especially in the last eight months or so, we've devoted really a lot of resources to teaching students, to trying to educate the Northwestern uh, community uh, and the broader public as well about issues pertaining to Jewish history, Israeli politics and society, the dynamics of anti-Semitism, and so on. And we'd be so gratified if the academic perspective and resources that we provide uh, were made available to as wide an audience as possible. So please do stay posted and continue to join us in the future. Now, apropos of those topics, we didn't know it when we invited our speaker uh, over a year ago, but uh, the speaker that we're gonna hear from tonight is really an expert whose voice is particularly essential given the complicated and challenging times that we find ourselves in. Professor Magda Tedder is professor of history and the Schwindler Chair of Judaic Studies at Fordham University. She's a scholar of early modern history who specializes in Jewish history, Jewish Christian relations, cultural, legal, and social history, and the history of transmission of historical knowledge in the pre-modern and modern periods. Tedder, Professor Tedder is a fellow of the American Academy for Jewish Research and is the author of four books, two edited volumes, and numerous, numerous articles in English, Hebrew, Italian, Polish, and maybe a few other languages that I didn't, uh, that I didn't catch. Uh, her first two books, Jews and Heretics in Catholic Poland, A Beleaguered Church in the Post-Reformation Era, which was published in 2006 by Cambridge University Press, and Sinners on Trial, Jews and Sacrilege After the Reformation, which was published by Harvard University Press in 2011, showcase her innovative work on Jewish-Christian relations during the early modern period, particularly but not exclusively in Eastern Europe. Uh, her third book, Blood Libel on the Trail of an Anti-Semitic Myth, which was published by Harvard University Press in 2020, uh, expands much, much further, uh, and really I can't recommend this book strongly enough. Um, my own um, really appreciation for the amazing work that she does there is echoed by the many book prizes that it's won. I'll just list a couple of them, the National Jewish Book Award, the uh, 2021 Roland Bainton Prize from the 16th Century Society, the 2021 George L. Moss Prize, there are a few others as well, just to give you a sense of the really celebrated um, uh, academic scholarship that Professor Tedder has produced. And her most recent book, about which we're going to have a chance to hear some more today, is Christian Supremacy, Reckoning with the Roots of Antisemitism and Racism, which was published by Princeton University Press in 2023. Now, this book is a major contribution to the field of antisemitism studies. Um, it's also a very daunting book to read as a fellow academic. Uh, as Professor Tedder says in the introduction, uh, she wrote this book while locked down during COVID uh, in response to, among other things, the Black Lives Matter protests, the rise in anti-Semitism in America, the sort of um, uh, developing public consciousness about the importance of these issues. And while I and many of my colleagues were 
um, you know, fighting for hand sanitizer and toilet paper or baking sourdough bread uh, in our kitchens, Professor Tedder produced an entire book, uh, which really revolutionizes the study of these topics. Um, so uh, we're seeing really the uh, amazing uh, results of that, uh, of that period of time. Um, there's a lot more that I could say if I had the time about her role in public history. Um, I'll just say that as somebody who um, someday aspires to uh, write for the public uh, and not just for academic crowds, Professor Tedder really is a model of somebody who has translated her ideas for not just fellow academics or students, but really for the broad public, uh, about her role as a community builder, somebody who's really taken the field of early modern Jewish studies and uh, put it on the map uh, for a really collaborative uh, and wonderful community. Um, lots more to say, but that would take away from her time at the podium. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Magda Tedder. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my regret is that I have to talk about these really uh, sad topics uh, in, the, in a, a very, very sad moment uh, in history we are living through. And if anything this year has shown us is that there is a need to rethink the way we have been uh, understanding uh, the topic of anti-Semitism. And uh, given the rise uh, of anti-Semitism, and I, uh, many of you here are from Skokie, and I, I was driven, I was driving through Skokie today to get to, from the airport here, um, that uh, with the current, um, in the current moment, uh, we see uh, a, a certain uh, level of animals that we didn't think uh, would. Uh, we would be seeing in 2020s, um, we thought was part of history. Um, the, um, I've been thinking about um, anti-Semitism um, as, a, as a teacher and as a, as a scholar, and certainly um, many uh, have made connections between anti-Semitism and racism. Some scholars have acknowledged that if somebody is an anti-Semite, they are likely to also be racist. And, uh, but I, I haven't felt that there was a deeper um, analytical explanation of how these two might connect. I also have been bewildered and dissatisfied with the scholarship of anti-Semitism that has been really now um, about 100 years or more than 100 years old, over a century old, which really focuses, and we are still dealing with it now, uh, with Congress debating definitions. What is anti-Semitism? What is not anti-Semitism? Scholars arguing about chronologies. Does it, is it the longest hatred? Has it always been? Or is it something modern that we need to understand in modern terms? Um, so I, as, teaching, teach, as a teacher and teaching about these topics, I felt this has been rather dissatisfying. And it was really uh, these questions, although they became much more amplified to me uh, after October 7th, one uh, topic that really was very clear that the scholarship of anti-Semitism doesn't, uh, doesn't address is what, whatever it is, anti-Semitism, let's use the shorthand for now, does. What does it do? What does it do for how does it work rather than uh, uh, working on these definitions? And um, uh, you, you can hear from my accent, I did not grow up in the United States. Um, so really on my, I grew up in Europe um, uh, where American history uh, was not really taught. So when I, when I came over years, I would start uh, reading about American history um, and uh, about black history uh, in America as well. And as I've been writing, uh, reading these, I, was, uh, I began to um, not, uh, note on the uh, margins certain parallels that struck me as a scholar of Jewish history that were uh, that were similar to some of the ideas about that, uh, that I've encountered as a scholar of Jewish history. 
And I began to, all, to rethink anti-Semitism in the light of, um, in light of black uh, studies. Um, I also have taught a class with my colleague, Tim taught a class in my with my colleague on anti-Semitism and racism. And we, doing this comparative work, we discovered that the two fields are diametrically different. The scholarship on anti-Semitism not only deals with these questions I discussed earlier, but also studies the anti-Semite. What do they think? How do they, how do they construct the Jew and all those things? Scholarship on, on racism uh, focuses on what racism does. There are no libraries of books on what is racism. Rather, it focuses on people and the impact racism and racist ideology has on, um, on people. And one of the things, that I, I'm not the first one to start thinking about the two, comparing um, then uh, all, uh, in the, er, in the mid, uh, in the, from the 1930s um, into the mid 20th century, other scholars, other thinkers, intellectuals have been thinking about it. And one example, I think about the value of comparison uh, came from an essay, from a speech, really, that, uh, that W.E.B. Du Bois gave um, the Negro in the Warsaw Ghetto. It was published under that title, uh, in which he, uh, who, uh, Du Bois, vi vi visited Europe several times, three times in the late 19th century and then in the early 20th century, and then visited the Warsaw Ghetto in 1948. And... He reflected on it, and he said that visiting Europe and seeing what was called at the time the Jewish problem made him not necessarily understand that issue for himself, but rather it gave him a real and more complete understanding of the Negro problem and the problem of slavery, emancipation, and caste. He understood it was no longer unique um, and separate. Um, and beginning, as I said, with really with the Nazi regime and the Nazi policies concerning Jews, uh, which were, by the way, inspired by the racial policies and laws in the United States, um, both Jewish and black intellectuals were engaging in the discussion about comparison. But for me, the aha moment came when I watched a film, I don't know whether you have uh, watched it, by Raoul Peck, I am not your Negro, about James Baldwin. And in that film, there is a clip uh, of James Baldwin from the PBS program, The Negro and the American Promise, in which he challenges white Americans to think why they invented the idea of an N, right? And he uses that word very emphatically because of its ugly power. Uh, but he says, I am not that. I am a man, and if you, ne if you need that, if you invented that, which I am not, then you need to ask yourself why you need it. And as I watched this clip, I said to myself, oh, this is like the Jew that was invented uh, by the anti-Semites or anti-Jewish ha uh, haters over the centuries that has nothing to do with the living and breathing Jews who lived their lives, who had families, who were neighbors, who wanted to have a normal life but who were cast as the Jew. And just to give you a, an example of, of what, why that moment was for me quite revelatory. So here is an example of the creation, right? Of that creation that of the end of the caricature of a black person that Baldwin was challenging. And here you have the comparison of that caricature to Christ 
and to a white man, again, to de literally dehum dehumanize uh, black people. Here is another example, um, uh, the caricature of a black child against Mary Virgin with the baby Jesus and a, a white girl. And then this is where my aha moment comes. The caricature of the Jew against the, uh, the image of the here an Aryan German man in the, uh, in, in the Nazi propaganda, Nazi children's literature. And then here is a less of a propaganda a piece. This is from uh, um, Oliver Twist, the Jew Fagan, as represented in, the, uh, in a 19th century uh, illustration. And note the iconographic similarity between the girl here and the girl here. Uh, so you can see that kind of peril. So I, I was asking, as, and I started jotting down similarities and the tropes that emerged from my reading, from my expertise in Jewish history, and from then my reading um, on uh, American history and black experience in America in particular. And here's, here are some of the parallels that I've, uh, that I've, that I've noticed. Um, both were seen as cursed by God. Um, both served as contrast figures, but for different reasons. Jews as contrast figures to Christianity, really constitutive of Christian identity. There would be no Christianity without uh, it defining itself against Judaism. And similarly, the, the black people serving as contrast figures, very constitutive to white identity in the colonies on the, um, on the uh, uh, other side of Atlantic in, in Europe, of Euro-Americans uh, uh, creating that identity. Both were seen as lazy, but for different reasons. So there are differences in, in as much as there are some similarities and overlaps. Note here, Jews are lazy uh, and willing to work and benefit from the exploitation of Christians, whereas black people were, uh, were presented as lazy uh, at the expense of white men. And that's a quote from 1866. Uh, both there are tropes of the insolent, arrogant Jew and there are tropes of the uppity black person. Both were seen as carnal and sexually dangerous, um, uh, Jews to Christian women, um, black men to white women. And I want to show you the visual representation of that. Here is the trope of the lecherous, dangerous black man ogling uh, a white woman, and of course, in a, one of the most ugly ways depicted in the, in the uh, film Birth of the Nation. And here is the trope of the lecherous Jew uh, similarly ogling the Christ, visually Christ, depicted as a Christian woman uh, a, in, and seen as dangerous to, uh, in the Nazi children's book to the white white race. And also, by the way, in the Nazi film, Yud Sus, there is a rape scene very much uh, corresponding to the birth of the nation as well. Uh, they were both represented visually as ugly um, in the anti-Semitic art. And of course, we've seen examples of what Henry Louis J Gates Jr. called the Sambo art. Uh, and here are, sometimes they were connected. Uh, in, in those caricatures. And there was the Jewish question and or Jewish problem and the Negro question or the Negro problem, uh, which you can see here in, uh, in literature, sometimes used in, in, this, in this way. Um, and, and, and essentially, both were rejected as equal citizens. So I, 
I asked myself why there are these striking parallels for people who had such different historical experiences. For people, Jews were not enslaved. They were persecuted, they were oppressed, but they were not enslaved. Black people were enslaved and their lived experiences were very different from, uh, from Jews in Europe. And yet, these ideas emerged, right? So like for W.E.B. Du Bois, that by reading uh, about black experience just out of, uh, out of curiosity and interest, I was able to see uh, uh, questions of anti-Semitism and anti-Jewish uh, prejudices and dynamic in a different light that began to crystallize and make better sense for, for me. So one of, the, uh, one of the things that we know from the study of racism, that racism is about power and it's about exclusion. That is something that is not discussed much in the scholarship of anti-Semitism, except, of course, for the trope of Jewish power, which I hope I'll explain where it comes from uh, today. So, but the question of power and also the question of, of uh, black oppression that stems from the, uh, uh, from the enslavement and the dynamic and social hierarchy that created um, is something that plays itself out in, on, a, on an, a level of ideas and tropes and also then law in the, uh, in, in the history of anti-Semitism as well. And it goes back to early, the earliest Christian texts, which are not anti-Semitic, as Fox News accused me of claiming. Um, but they set the, the hierarchy of values the, in the contrasting of what Paul was trying to invent, that, that notion of, of, Jude, of, of the new Jesus sex, what becomes Christianity, in contrast to uh, Judaism of the time uh, during the Second Temple period as he is trying to expand this this idea, and he said he discusses it in this contrasting way by casting the newly emerging Christianity through the language of faith, through the language of freedom, through the language of promise, um, and Judaism through the language of law, through the language of slavery, through the language of earthly Jerusalem. Judaism is the Jerusalem of the present, and you have to remember that the Jerusalem of the present for Paul is the Jerusalem where the animal sacrifices are still performed, uh, the Jerusalem temple is still standing. That's the Jerusalem of the present. present. And the Jerusalem of above is different from him, is that, Jer that Jerusalem of faith. But he assigns it certain value. These are not neutral terms. Freedom uh, versus slavery, faith versus law, promise versus, um, versus uh, uh, flesh have, uh, have a value attached to it. And he explore, explains more about this, that, that not the children of the flesh are the children of God, but the children of the promise. And then he uses in a in a, a passage that really deals with what we today might call the idea of predestination, of God's uh, purpose, uh, the, the, the passage from the book of Genesis, the elder shall serve the younger. And that is a passage that will take a life of, uh, on its own uh, over the next centuries and create and help create not just a hierarchy of values, but also social and legal hierarchies too. Several centuries, I jumped across uh, a Christian writer, Augustine, famous for his City of God and his, uh, and his uh, Confessions, which many of you may have read, takes that verse from, from the book of Genesis via Paul 
And in a new context, in the context when the Roman Empire is now a Christian empire, where Christianity is the religion of a state, of the empire, and reinterpreted in a different way. And he says, as to the statement, the elder, the elder shall serve the younger, scarcely anyone among us has understood it to mean anything else than the elder, older people, the Jews, should serve the younger Christian people. Um, the primacy of the elder is transferred to the younger, and the, the elder Esau passionately craved lentils, which the younger prepared for his meal. What could be clearer than the reference in, in these two promises is to the people of Israelite and to the whole world. The former according, according to the flesh and the latter according to faith. Flesh and faith coming back with these value judgments. And he talks, continues to talk about the two covenants, the old and the new. It's like today, old is bad, new is good. My new iPhone is better than your old iPhone, right? Um, a certain part of the earthly city um, has been used to make the image of the heavenly city. Again, contrasting earthly and heavenly. Servitude and, and freedom. Uh, Hagar, who was Sarah's slave, represented together with her son the image of this earthly city. And since the shadow where, shadows were to vanish in the coming light, shadows and light, Sarah was free and symbolized the free uh, city. So these are two covenants, right? The, the ones I showed you in blue uh, represent Judaism. The one in gray represent Christianity. But that idea is, th these were still ideas. This is still language of theology and writing. But they were now, with the Christian empire, uh, with Roman empire as a Christian empire, translated into law as well. So if we're talking, we understand the ideas of structural racism as embedded in law and social structures. Here, theology is translated in law uh, creating effective social and legal structures and putting Jews in a different social level. The first several ideas, uh, several uh, areas are regulated. One is the ownership of slaves. The Roman society was a slave society in a different way than the New World slave society, chattel slavery in the New World. Um, but it regulated who could own a slave, and it was prohibited for Jews to buy a Christian slave and contaminate him with Jewish sacraments, convert him from Christian to Jew. Here, the language is still a little bit concerned with Jewish proselytism and conversion, but later on, we begin to, in 438, we begin to have begin to see, hear the language of Jewish power, of power, authority over Christians. If one of the Jews shall buy and circumcise a Christian slave or any other sect, he shall be raised from that Jew's power and remain in liberty. Uh, Christianity, again, now is liberty, uh, and Jewish power is, becomes an, an issue in this, in this uh, context. And that later on, when slavery uh, transforms in a feudal society into serfdom and other areas, you have prohibition of Jews hiring Christian servants. And the, and the fear is that Jews would have authority over Jews, so the fear of Jewish power. Um, here you have um, in, in, the in, in, a, in a, a text that becomes a part of the canon law later on, um, that, if, uh, that uh, the Pope learned that Christian slaves are held in servitude by Christians, and he prohibits it, says that no Jew is permitted to hold Christian slaves in his power, and if Christian slaves are to be found among them, they shall be given liberty. Christians could own Christian servants, uh, Christian slaves or, or servants, but Jews could not do it. So you have a, a distinctive 
uh, hierarchy. You also have that idea of Jewish authority over Christian is then translated to the prohibition of Jews holding public office, the exclusion from public office. Um, because of, again, the anxiety over the mastery of Jews over Christians. Uh, and uh, they, should, they shall not be appointed judges over Christian population, nor permitted to be tax collectors, for thus Christians would be seen, God forbid, to be subjected to them. We see, again, in law, this anxiety about Jewish position uh, in the social hierarchy. Jews should never be in a higher position than Christians. And that language then is embedded in throughout centuries. I'll just, I, I won't be reading it, I promise. Um, but in, in, by the 13th century, you begin to see it uh, coupled with, uh, with theology again. The Jews who by their own uh, uh, guilt are consigned to perpetual servitude because they crucified their old. They shouldn't be ungrateful to us and should not um, uh, return the, the, the pay for, for uh, intimacy with contempt. Um, the, the rulers should restrain the excesses of the Jews, and, and this passage, listen to that, they sh so that they shall not dare raise their neck bowed under the yoke of perpetual slavery against the reverence of Christian faith, lest the children of the free woman should be slaves to the children of a slave, but that rather the uh, slaves rejected by God, Jews should recognize themselves as slaves to those whom Christ's death set free, at, at the, as at the same time it enslaved them. But Jews now grow insolent, right? The same thing is uh, here about exercising authorities. It is absurd that, that Jews, the a blasphemer of Christ should ex exercise authority over Christians. Uh, Jews should be prohibited from being given preference in matter of public office, since in such capacity they are most troublesome to Christians. Uh, in a bull, Pope uh, Paul IV establishing the Roman ghetto, again, uh, reiterates that language that Jews own guilt consigned them to perpetual slavitude, servitude, and Jews now attempt to exchange the servitude they owe to Christians for dominion over them. The dominion, what do they have? They have nice homes in nice parts of towns. They are not, don't, not wearing badges. They are not distinguished. They live, in, they live their lives intermixed with Christians. Uh, so they erupted in insolence. That's the insolence. And the Pope reiterated that they should, as long as Jews persist in their errors, they should recognize through experience. Right? This is what I'm saying now. We need to pay attention to the experience part. Through experience that they have been made slaves where Christians have been made free through Jesus Christ and our Lord, that is, it, it is iniquitous that the children of the free woman should serve the children of the maid servant. And it, again, it continues the idea of Jews as not deserving to be in any position of power, but then in modern times also equality uh, stems from that language. Here you have a caricature of Jews uh, in, in being served by a Christian woman in a in an po uh, anti-Semitic postcard. Um, in, up, just after World War II, just so that you think, oh, it's just old stuff from the pre-modern period, here is a, a quote from a bishop from uh, 1945. In Poland, uh, Jews are asking him to help with anti-Semitism against the survivors. And he says, Jews, you are so talented lawyers and businessmen. Why don't you just help rebuild Poland? Why do you need to, and this is the, the issue, engage in politics, right? Politics is about political power, about influence. Can you imagine what it looks like when a priest comes to the ministry and a Jewish woman is sitting there, God knows from where, and treats our clergy with superiority and insolence? discomfort of Jews in position, official positions of power over Christians. This was translated into visual language. Uh, you have the classic image of the Judea Capta, Judea Capta that was issued by the Roman 
a still pagan Roman Empire of subjugating Ju uh, Judea, right, and eventually also renaming Judea as pa uh, Palestina. Uh, and then in uh, ecclesiastical uh, 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 visual representation of ecclesia or the church as this triumphant queen holding cross and, and a chalice or a s uh, orb and the humiliated maid maiden synagogue. Uh, and it continues over centuries. So what about racism? So what the Christian attitudes towards Judaism created is created a sense of cr Christian superiority, but also created legal structures of Christian supremacy. And I use the word Christian supremacy in a very technical way of talking about political power, right? A power of the state and creating these structures. Uh, so European Christians thought of themselves as, uh, as superior. So when they begin to uh, explore and expand and colonize the world, they translate that superiority that developed in the context of Jews onto the, the rest of the world. And the, the ecclesia, the church, transforms into Europa. And the Europa, the Europe, the, the, the woman is still a queen, is still a reigning queen. It is still a Christian queen. You can see the cross and the globe and the crown. But now she's no longer ruling over the synagogue of the medieval period. She's now ruling over the other continents, America, Asia, and Africa. Right? And that becomes really a trope. She is the reigning queen, over superior, always superior, always Christian. She never loses that Christianity uh, over the uh, um, uh, otherwise um, uh, other continents. Right? And then by the 18th century, Africa is also racialized as black. Uh, earlier, uh, Europeans are thinking of Africa as North Africa. And those structures, both mental habits of thinking about the European identity, Europeans as superior uh, to everybody else, but also about Jews as inferior, then are all, uh, translated both in the racial attitudes, but also in legal forms in the colonies. And here is just an example. I, I, I can give you a ton of examples uh, of a of a law in the state, in the, not state, in the colony of Virginia uh, regulating uh, servants. And that, I think you'll hear something we've seen earlier. No Negroes, mulattoes, or Indians, although Christians, or Jews, Moors, Mahometans, that is Muslims, and other infidels shall purchase any Christian servant nor any other except of their own complexion. And if any Negro, mulatto, or Indian, Jew, Moor, Mahometan, or other infidel um, not, shall not withstanding purchase any Christian white servant, this said servant shall ipso facto become free. So what we had in the Roman law that Christianity set you free, here you have the combination of ra race and religion. Whiteness and Christianity racial is, is, is sets you free, but if you are a Christian of a different complexion, you might still be uh, um, enslaved, or perhaps if you are also a person of a different, an infidel too. So liberty became associated and represented, in fact, as a, as a white woman. Uh, in that iconographic thing. And actually, America also changes race once it becomes the United States of America, and the representation of America becomes Colombia. And you can see here, America be, uh, from the 18th century as this uncivilized, um, savage woman, ha uh, highly undressed, and then Colombia, this very triumphant uh, woman reminiscent of our ecclesia. 
at the time when Europeans were inventing these ideas of race, they were also uh, creating other hierarchies, and they were also racializing Jews. Um, so, but Jewish racial, racialization actually comes via religion in the Enlightenment era. So Europeans are really interested in studying um, the other religions, and it ends up in the end that Christianity is superior to everything else, um, but even as they are criticizing Christianity. Uh, but what they turn to is they always start with Judaism as the sort of first religion, and they pose Judaism in what, what Christians called the Holy Land or Palestine at the time, uh, and they study it from the biblical perspective. So again, animal sacrifices and all that stuff that you read in the Bible. Um, then they compare it and they write about other religions in Africa and Asia and other places and show animalistic, or animistic practices and sacrifices, and they see how Jews, you see how primitive they are. They are not... They are oriental, they are other, they don't belong here. Here's an example of that. So the orientalization or the Europeanization of the Jews who lived in Europe. Obviously, there were lots of Jews living in Asia and North Africa uh, and, and, and other places. But here is a, a book from the early 18th century uh, that compares the practices of Jews, biblical Israelites, to the practices of East Indians. In India, in this particular passage uh, compares the enchantment of the uh, serpent snakes in India with Moses and his staff and his serpent in this. So we have a very explicit orientalization of Jews, and that then brings us to, in the 19th century, to the Jews going Nach Palestina, right? They, they, they run the back to Jerusalem with sacks and packs, the pack, uh, uh, Nach Palestina, you can see these nine, uh, early 20th century anti-Semitic uh, ideas. Um, so again, what we, what we see is uh, the development of what I say white Christian supremacy. So when we, uh, during the, uh, the, the rise of Bl uh, Black Lives Matter, Matter, it was often talked about white supremacy. And I kept saying, well, wait, cr the Christian aspect has never been lost, right? So what we see here is that in the context of black people, uh, the, the dynamic is different from that uh, of, of Christian supremacy over Jews. Um, the idea of race emerges from the status quo of enslavement and from a position of power over black people. Then Europeans have tried to justify this, uh, especially in the Enlightenment era when they are beginning to talk about toleration and, uh, and uh, equal rights and so on. So they be begin to justify it by developing an idea of race, and then it transforms into an ideology of racism uh, and white supremacy. In the context of Jews, uh, the, the Christian superiority emerges actually from the position of weakness, uh, from the early moments of Christianity when it tries to justify itself as this tiny sect, and it needed to convince its followers, saying, no, 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 God is with us. This is wrong what Jews are doing. God is with us. We are the chosen people. We are the ones from the promise. We are the ones of the, of the heavenly Jerusalem. So it emerges from a theological idea from, of weakness that gives this sort of boost to that. Then it transforms to the position of power, of law, into Christian supremacy, and then it, that law reifies, makes real those theological hierarchies that the theological texts exert. And where it ends up, it ends up in a white Christian supremacy that dominates the Western world and exclu uh, exclusion from equality of both uh, Jews and uh, uh, black people. Uh, so in the... Uh, 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 in the modern era, just briefly, I want to I talk about this idea of citizenship. 
uh, is citizenship is about equality. When you have people who, who perceive themselves as superior, they developed habits of thinking about those others as inferior and non-deserving. So when modern nations were beginning to who, uh, talk about who belongs, who is the we the people, they were debating whether Jews belong to the we the people uh, just as in the, uh, in, the, in the United States. There were debates whether black people belong to the we the people too. So uh, in modern states, that hierarchy, those habits of thinking from the pre-modern period translate into these debates over, uh, over citizenship. And here you can uh, see how Jews are seen that they are from Asia, that they differ from others, and should they belong uh, to that? Should the law of Moses make uh, citizenship and full integrations of Jews not uh, impossible? They will never integrate, unlike the other Christians, Catholics, Lutherans, and, and, and others. Um, Another one says the imperative law, it says it's imperative not to grant to Jews whom we must always consider as foreigners among us the equality and the rights of French citizens and active citizens. In the Netherlands, similar debates were, uh, think, do we continue to regard Jews as people, as alien? Do we allow them to be fellow citizens on equal footing? Um, Jews cannot share in our Dutch social rights as citizens, as long as they are Jews. The rights of, uh, are, are we talking about the rights of men or only of Christian men, right? Of citizens or only Christian citizens? They are really, we're talking about this. And in the Net Dutch debates, actually, they are connecting, again, that exclusion of Jews with the exclusion of, of black people. Um, we, sh we would not be obliged to incorporate all these thousands of Jews at once into all the relations of our hitherto completely distinct society, just as we're not required to accept every other alien immediately in all civil rights. The prudent care for the general well-being would be in their regard demand that their transition from the state of alienation and deep humiliation to citizenship and equality takes place. The rights of men untimely granted to the slaves of San Domingo served to the destruction of that French population and freedom without enlightenment is altogether like sharpened steel in the hands of children. Uh, so the, the rejection is really about Jews being equal in the, from the polity in Europe. The idea of human rights, Bruno Bauer argued in the 19th century, was discovered for the Christian world in the century, in last century. It was not meant to include Jews. Um, Wilhelm Marr, who, in, who popularized the word anti-Semitism to actually obfuscate, uh, because it was not very popular to reject Jews, to obfuscate that, he said, this is a completely Semitic race. Its homeland is in Palestine. But from, and he says, I protect Jews from religious discrimination, but from Jewish emancipation, that is the acquisition of equal citizenship rights, including political rights. Uh, really, a Jewish emancipation really did no more than recognize the existing alien domination. And then he turns what he means to that. And, and says to his people, you elect the alien, you elect the Jew, the alien masters to your parliaments. You make them your legislators and judges, right? Again, the Jews should not hold public office, but you are now doing this. Um, and again, emancipation, so granting citizenship right to Jews is about literal pa parity, but we Germans are after all a Christian nation and Jews are only a minority. Jews are nothing but German-speaking Orientals, right? Jews could never be equal. They should always be rejected. They were the alien, and, and there were cartoons to that. Very similar language is echoed in the, black, in the debate over black citizenship and belonging. Here, from the Missouri debate, you have a... Um, a representative, Barbour from, uh, from Virginia, 
uh, saying that don't tell me not, tell me not that the Constitution, when it speaks of we the people, means these, right? Indians, free Negroes, Mugros, Negroes, mulattoes, and slaves. The argument in favor of including in the class of citizen free people of color goes too far. It was meant we the white people, right? And there is a whole debate and said, so, no, 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 you're wrong. There are debates over that and that was a thing. And then of course the Dred Scott case uh, uh, ruled that, uh, asked the question and, and answered in the negative, can a Negro whose ancestors were important to this country and so that slave become a member of a political community formed and brought into existence by the Constitution of the United States? as such became entitled to all rights and privileges and immunities guaranteed by that instrument? And the answer was no. And, and, uh, and again, after the Civil War, uh, the, it, it, the 14th Amendment, and then they had to deal with that. So what we see in that process is that on both sides of the Atlantic, in one case, around racialized religion concerning Jews, and in the other, uh, on the other side of the Atlantic um, is explicitly around race, we have the exclusion of both Jews and black people from the we, we the people, we the nation. So there were similarities, but there were also these differences, and which I uh, outlined to you earlier. And uh, the important difference in that is that uh, the Jewish servitude is in the realm of idiom, of idea, not actual enslavement, but it nonetheless created in Europe and uh, in Christianity, although arguably also in Islam, uh, a framework of thinking about Jews as inferior. Uh, the Jews uh, were an inferior position, but they certainly uh, possessed rights and and privileges in Christian lands. Um, but the habits of thinking about Jews as inferior